Thank you, Dr. Sondek, and good morning to everyone. Thanks for coming on a wonderful Saturday morning. We appreciate your time. Um, as some of my colleagues, notice, notably Dr. Zago, was ribbing me earlier today saying I still wear a suit on a Saturday morning, but then I told him that's part of what we do in the Northeast. So we're still not yet a native Floridian, but if we do this next year, we'll get the shirts. We'll get it. So if, if he notices, Folks like me who've been trained more in the British system, and Dr. Smalley will be following up. He's wearing a suit as well. So, all right. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is break this down into some simple segments in terms of understanding where we are with immunotherapy, because immunotherapy has completely changed paradigms in the management of advanced melanoma. Briefly on disclosures, I do get research funding, and all of this goes directly to the institute from a variety of companies for clinical trials. And what is metastatic melanoma? Melanoma that has spread to different parts of the body. And this is a very simplistic version of that. Uh, melanoma is one of those diseases that I explain to patients where life and death, unfortunately, can be measured in a matter of millimeters. As we explain, as many of you may have come to my clinic, I tell them it's not how big it is on the surface, it really is how deep it is. And that's where it becomes exceedingly important. The most common places that melanoma can spread to include the lymph nodes. We already discussed some on the sentinel lymph node biopsies and lymph node dissections. And then once it goes beyond that into the lung, the liver, the bone, the brain, these are what are referred to as advanced stage or stage four melanoma. And surgery does have a role in some of those cases where there's maybe one spot that needs to be taken out. But once it starts traveling to other areas, we have to now start thinking globally or more systemically that these are patients who either require intravenous therapy or who require pill therapies to try and target all of these cancer cells elsewhere. Um, these are what, are we, what we refer to as Kaplan-Meier curves on the x-axis and the y-axis. This is where everyone starts off together. And what I'm trying to show you here on these two curves is how prognosis changes based on where the cancer has spread to. So the blue line here is when metastatic melanoma has involved mainly the skin, the subcutaneous tissues, so areas below the skin, or lymph nodes that are in a distant organ or distant region. The middle line right here is when it involves the lung, which is called stage 4B. And then everything else, that means if somebody has liver involvement, bone involvement, or brain involvement, that is called stage 4C. And what you can clearly see is these curves separate out, which means the folks in blue tend to do better than folks who have lung metastases, who in turn tend to do better compared to folks who have other metastases. So that is one thing that we take into account when we try to make treatment decisions for these patients. The other thing that's also important is something called an LDH level, lactate dehydrogenase. This is a marker or an enzyme that we check in blood. It is normally produced by the liver and the bone in pretty much all normal individuals. But in some cases of melanoma, about a third of melanoma, we can see a high LDH level. And those patients who have a high LDH level to start with, the one in the yellow here, tend to have an inferior prognosis compared to those who have a normal LDH level. I'll tell you a little bit later why that becomes important as well. This is what we were used to. So many of us who went through medical school um, looking at melanoma, unfortunately at that point, the prognosis was not very good. What this essentially tells us here on the x-axis, this is overall survival, that is how long are patients living, and these are pretty much what we refer to as median or average numbers. At that time, the only drug that we had was something called DTIC or decarbazine, which is an intravenous form of chemotherapy. Um, the average survivorship was about eight months. With polychemotherapy, which means multiple drugs, survival was marginally larger. Biochemotherapy, where we are combining uh, biological agents along with chemotherapy and then immunochemotherapy. So as you can see, pretty much we were not breaking the one-year barrier. So our standards were actually quite low. And traditionally, there was a very nihilistic approach in the management of melanoma. All of this changed with immunotherapy. So melanoma is one of those diseases where the immune system plays an exceedingly important role. It is one of those which we refer to as 
one of the most immunogenic cancers known to mankind. That there is so many new, there are so many nuances within the immune system that how can we harness the power of the immune system to help us overcome this disease? And this is a teeter totter or a slot uh, or a seesaw, as we call it. Um, you either want to block suppressive elements, that means drugs that are designed to hopefully release the brakes on the immune system. And this is where most of my talk will uh, be based on what we now refer to as anti-PD-1 agents and anti-CTLA-4 agents. Um, or you want to supplement the missing links that there's something missing in the immune system or maybe it's not functioning as well as it should function. So you want to give it that little bit of a boost. So we use drugs such as interleukin-2 or high-dose IL-2 as we call it. Uh, in the adjuvant setting, Dr. Irola already mentioned, talking about interferon as well. So again, this is a very simplistic approach to Immunology 101. And this is a little bit more fancy in terms of a cartoon as to what actually happens inside the body. This part I'll leave to Dr. Swally to discuss in his next talk. This is talking about BRAF and all of the target therapies. But again, very simplistically, this is a normal lymphocyte, which is one of the most important cells in our immune system. This is the melanoma cell, or the cancer cell, and this is something we refer to as the antigen-presenting cell. When someone develops a tumor, there's a constant interaction, and I just want to draw your attention to two things. Now, don't, don't worry about anything else. Just draw your attention to PD-1, PD-L1, and CTLA-4, B7. These are the two interactions, and this is what normally occurs, and these are the breaks on the immune system. Because the melanoma cell expresses what is referred to as PDL1. It interacts with the lymphocyte and gives the lymphocyte a signal saying, I am not going to let you take care of me. I'm not going to let you destroy me. So in other words, it's activating the brakes on that immune system. So think of this now, that you have a drug called an anti-PD1 agent where you actually block this off. In other words, now you're releasing that brake and now the lymphocyte suddenly wakes up and says, I am now ready to go back and fight against the melanoma. That's exactly what we do. So this was the therapeutic timeline. Until the year 2011, we had only two approved drugs in the management of advanced melanoma. Dacarbazine, which is a chemotherapy drug, and I told you the efficacy was modest at best. And then in 1998, high-dose interleukin-2 was approved, and I'll show you some slides on that. But basically, between here and here, span of almost two decades, we had virtually no breakthrough in melanoma. And then came along epilimumab, or your boy, bemurafenib, which is a BRAF-targeted drug. So this is an oral agent, this is intravenous. Then in 2013, we had two more agents approved. 2014 was the year of the anti-PD-1 agent's approval. So bemurlizumab, which I now also refer to, many of you know this, the Jimmy Carter drug. Everyone knows about Keytruda and then nivolumab, which is Optivo, manufactured by a different company. And then last year, the combination of the two of them together, ipilimumab plus nivolumab. So the last five years have essentially been like a watershed era in melanoma therapeutics. One of the drugs that I used a lot of when I was in upstate New York was high-dose interleukin-2. So this was approved by the FDA back in 1998 based on its ability to produce deep and long-lasting responses, albeit in a small number of patients with advanced melanoma. Translate that into, we could cure some of these patients. This is very intensive therapy. Basically, we admit patients into the hospital from Monday through Saturday, and every eight hours, if possible, we give them very, very high doses of IL-2. They go home for a week, and then they come back for a second week of exactly the same therapy. This plus this is a total of 28 doses of treatment. The vast majority of patients are not able to tolerate that. This is toxic therapy. On an average, patients will get somewhere around 15 to 18 doses of therapy. And what I want to draw your attention to here is this is the survival with high-dose IL-2. And again, this is an old paper from Dr. Atkins from 1999, but this is what led to the approval of IL-2. So again, all patients start up here, so you have 100 patients. Think of one equal to 100. And unfortunately, most of them succumb to their disease. But look what happens here. At two years, those patients who've had a nice response, they are still alive. This is all the way down to 10 years, which means that with high-dose IL-2, we can actually cure about 15 to 18% of our patients, despite the fact that they have advanced melanoma. 
So that's important. When we see these plateaus at the end of a survival curve, we know that we are doing some good. What we ideally would like to see this plateau somewhere up here, and in the most optimistic scenario, just a flat line here, where 100 patients we start with, and we end up with 100 patients, which means we're curing every single one of them. So we still had a long way to go when we started off here. This is what happens with IL-2. Um, this is very similar to one of the uh, slides that Dr. Zager showed. This is a patient who has multiple cutaneous and subcutaneous metastases from melanoma. And this was where a previous nodal dissection had been done. And then following high-dose IL-2, you can see all of this essentially disappeared. And there was this change or hypopigmentation we refer to as vitiligo, where, which clearly indicates a very, very nice response. And we see some of these similar responses with some of the newer drugs that I'll talk about too. The caveats are, this is highly toxic therapy, so this is not for everyone. It causes leakiness of the blood vessels, and almost every single side effect that occurs is related to that leakiness. It needs to be administered only in specialized centers, preferably in an ICU-like setting. We can do that here at Moffitt. We did it at Roswell Park. And I'll show you a slide later. Dr. Sarnayak will expand a little bit more on the TIL program. And patients must have heart function, normal lung function, and normal, essentially normal brain function. So in other words, this is not for everyone. It is for a minority of patients. Yeah. Moving on to anti-CTLA-4. This is a cartoon that, again, highlights what I told you a little bit earlier. This is the cancer cells. These are the antigen-presenting cells. And these are the, lymph no, uh, these are the lymphocytes. Yeah. So this is a normal interaction. And what happens is, as I told you earlier, the tumor tells the lymphocyte, uh-uh, I'm not going to allow you to destroy me. So that's in black over here. So essentially what it tells the lymphocyte, you need to go back to sleep, we are shutting you down. Now what happens if you see these, these are the antibodies to CTLA-4. So they're basically sort of in a decoy. They're taking these receptors for CTLA-4 away Therefore, now the lymphocyte does not get that restraining signal and is allowed to start proliferating, which means it starts to increase in number, and then it also expands what is called IL-2, which is again the cytokine, which is trying to fight against the tumor. So this was the trial that got the approval of ipilimumab back in 2011. And this was a large trial where uh, patients were randomized to receive ipilimumab by itself, which is your boy, three doses at three week intervals, or GP100, which is, which is like the equivalent of a vaccine, or the combination of the two. And again, going back to the survival curves, this is the overall survival, and again, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that unfortunately, most patients did not respond, but the ones who did, there was a nice flat line at the end, that means we were curing those patients as well. And there's a distinct separation of these curves, which tells you that the experimental arm, or the ipilimumab, was superior to GP100, and that's what led to its approval. And this is one of my patients from Roswell Park. This is uh, a PET scan of a patient. This is the belly. Some of you may have seen your own scans. This is the front, this is the back. And this is a large, what's called pet avid tumor, which means it takes up the radioactive dye um, and then this is also in the belly. So this was back in May 2013. The patient got four doses of ipilimumab in between. And then in December 2013, you can pretty much see this is a normal PET scan at that point in time. This patient is now in complete remission after four doses of ipi. So we can do some good things with this drug. Which then begs the next question, can cure be a reality in metastatic melanoma? This was a large compilation uh, a couple of years ago, almost 5,000 patients um, who had been treated with IPI, either on clinical trial or off. The average survivorship is not that great. It is about 10 months. But if you start looking at how many patients are actually making it out to three years, mind you, these are patients with advanced disease, metastatic disease. And if you recall, I mentioned one of the earlier slides with chemotherapy, the median survival was about seven months. We're now talking about 20% of patients surviving to three years and about 17% of patients, so one in five is making it out to seven years. In other words, they're going back to living normal lives. I'd like to make that five out of five and not one out of five, but we are slowly getting towards that. And the longest overall survival for that particular cohort of patients was about 10 years. So there was someone there who was 
received ipilimumab over 10 years ago? And so the answer is yes. Cure can certainly be a reality in this disease, and we're slowly getting to that point too. But what are the problems? This drug, just like IL-2, can also be toxic. And the toxicity is actually very, very similar to the mechanism of action. So think of it as you're unleashing the immune system, you're upregulating the immune system, side effects are directly related to that as well. And what I'd like to stress is provider and patient education and communication between provider and patient is very, very key to the early recognition. The big problems that many of you may have already heard about, they can get skin rashes or dermatitis, they can get diarrhea and colitis, which in 5% of patients can be quite severe. This is grade three and four, meaning um, high grade diarrhea, many, many bowel movements per day, and or inflammation of the large bowel. Patients can develop thyroid problems, inflammation of the liver, so on and so forth. So we need to be very, very cognizant about these toxicities. And how do we manage them? Early recognition is key. You identify them early, start patients on steroids, and then we do a very slow taper approximately over a month or a month and a half. And some of these patients, despite the steroid therapy, they can actually develop a recurrence of that problem and may require other drugs such as infliximab. So now, again, go back to the teeter-totter. Now you're again trying to suppress the immune system because you've overstimulated it and trying to find that right balance. This is another rare toxicity that occurs called hypophysitis, which used to be described primarily in textbooks. So this is an MRI of the brain. And right here is what I refer to as the master gland of the body called the pituitary gland. And after the drug, and again, this is one of my patients um, in practice back in 2013, um, a gentleman with melanoma with metastases to the adrenal gland, he received ipilimumab, and this was started developing severe headaches. And we did blood tests on him and found that basically due to the pituitary in getting inflamed and shutting down, all of his hormones, which are the steroid hormones, the thyroid hormones, and testosterone were all basically um, down in the toilet. As a result of this um, inflammation in the pituitary, and now the pituitary is large, it actually looks as though there's a tumor in there, but once you start these patients on steroids, that settles down quite nicely, and I'm sure there are some in the audience who have actually experienced this complication as well. So then this is, this is sort of a rip-off on the Samsung Apple War on the iPhone versus the Samsung phone. So the next big thing, um, anti-CTLA-4 was good, but what is even better? And the next big thing was anti-PD-1. So there are two drugs that are now approved. One is nivolumab, and the other one is pembrolizumab. And this was basically based on a rapid series of studies that essentially showed that the response rate for anti-PD-1 drugs is as high, as high as 30%. That means one in three people getting it will clearly show an improvement. Things will start shrinking down, and sometimes they can shrink down pretty quickly. The survival, OS, overall survival, was about 17 months, so a year and a half. Now, mind you, these are already heavily pretreated patients, so a year and a half in those patients is actually quite good. Um, and now look at four-year survivals. About a third of our patients are making it out to four years. If I took you back 15 years ago, this number was probably about 5 to 8 percent. So we've definitely made increment, incremental improvements over time. And the other drug, the sister drug, is pembrolizumab. Again, these are examples directly from the New England Journal Manuscript where somebody with a large lung mass over here received pembrolizumab and then look at it after approximately three months of therapy. Similarly, this is the liver, a very large tumor sitting in the liver and then disappearing down to almost nothing. Certainly in manuscripts, in publications, we like to show the most dramatic of cases to at least press home the point. But the bottom line is that in a disease, where we typically really did not see this happening, this was very exciting to see. And that has also now translated into these patients living longer and living better lives and hopefully again curing them. So the natural question in the last two or three slides is if anti-CTLA-4, ipilimumab is good, and anti-PD-1, i.e. nivolumab or pembrolizumab is good, how about putting them together? So is one plus one better than two? And this is, again, a large study, 10, uh, almost 1,000 patients, where they looked at the combination of IPI plus NEVO versus NEVO versus ipilimumab. 
RR stands for response rates. Now, if you recall, the likelihood of things shrinking down with Nevo or Pembroke is about a third, 30%. Look at the response rate here, 58%. So now almost two thirds of patients are responding. That being said, and some of these are complete responses, that means all visible disease on the scan disappears. But the problem here is, while the responses are high, the toxicities are also very, very high in the combination. So again, the combination is not for everyone, because some of these patients can get life-threatening diarrhea, life-threatening colitis, and a variety of other um, neurological complications, endocrine complications, pancreatitis, so we have to be very cognizant about who we can use the combination in, and we have to become a little smarter about trying to modulate some of these doses. But what is clearly important, PFS is progression-free survival, so that means the time it takes for the cancer to figure out and become a little bit smarter is almost now a year versus about three months for epilimumab alone. So it's clearly superior, but we have to be very aware of the possible toxicity. So again, this is a waterfall plot similar to what Dr. Zager showed. And this is, so basically the more you have below, the better it is. And you can see the combination certainly has more responses, but we want to see long-term survival data and hopefully cure from these agents. This is what can occur in terms of skin toxicity. So patients can develop a variety of skin rashes. I showed you endocrine toxicity earlier. So we have to be very, very cognizant. Um, I always like to show this slide, it ain't over till it's over, and Dr. Sarnayak will talk a little bit more about TIL, which is tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, so I won't spend any more time on this, uh, but this is something that we can do at Moffitt and have done for several years um, to date. So how do I choose? I choose based on the burden of disease. Does the patient have symptoms or not? Or did we just pick this up because of scans? Functional status, how active are you? Um, are you able to do everything? Are you the only re is, is it the only reason that I know you have cancer because I see it on the scans, or are you actually feeling more fatigued, more tired, more short of breath? BRAF status, which Dr. Uh, Smalley will talk about, and do you have any other major medical conditions? And what does the evidence tell us? The evidence clearly tells us that an anti-PD-1 agent is better than ipilimumab, a resounding yes. The combination EP plus NEVO is better than EP, yes. EP plus NEVO, better than NEVO, we really don't know yet. So we're waiting for long-term data on that. Uh, Moffitt did a trial here based, and I'm sure some of you may have participated in that, where we started with EP followed by NEVO, or the reverse sequence. We're waiting for more mature data on that in terms of long-term survival. IL-2 versus any of these, we really don't know the answer to that because that will likely never be done. IL-2 plus any of these trials are currently ongoing, and then TIL certainly on a clinical trial. So this is a summary of options. If somebody has a BRAF mutant melanoma, but they are asymptomatic, we will almost invariably start with an anti-PD-1 agent, either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. I call that IT or immunotherapy. If they are symptomatic, clearly we need something that works quickly for these patients. We would give them a combination of uh, targeted drugs, drugs which will be in the next talk, or a combination of immunotherapy, in other words, that high risk but potential high reward. If they are BRAF wild type, they don't harbor that mutation, immunotherapy or possibly chemotherapy. And then if these don't work, then we go on to ipilimumab if we've not used it before, or any of the other options if they haven't been used before. And again, I stress here, a clinical trial is appropriate at any juncture. So the last five years have clearly been a renaissance in melanoma therapeutics. Immunotherapy is potentially curative, yet all will not benefit. So that's why we have to continue doing what we are doing. The investigations on combination therapy, sequential therapy will certainly evolve. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to all of those here who have participated in clinical trials and supported these in melanoma. Because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be doing what we are doing. So thank you for your attention.